I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. Good morning, Victory. We're glad you've joined us this morning, whether here in person or online. We ask that you stand and join us as we worship this morning. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
have a seat and we're going to move into a time of communion this morning. And we do this every week because it's a time of celebration and remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross through his body that was given, his blood that was shed. But we don't end there. We, we end with an empty tomb and it's, that's not the end either because Jesus is alive today and he was faithful then to the cross. And he was faithful in the empty tomb. He will be faithful now. So no matter what we bring into this time today, whatever we bring into this place, fear, doubt, brokenheartedness, depression, anxiety, no matter what we bring in here today, we can lay that at the feet of Jesus right now during this time of reflection and communion because he was faithful then and he will be faithful now so whatever we bring in here today lay it at the foot of the cross and lay it at the door of the empty tomb because Jesus will be faithful now so as we celebrate through the emblems the bread which represents his body and the juice which represents his blood Whatever you have at home, if you just hopefully your communion is ready, but if you've grabbed communion, 
is to remember the body and the blood that were given in faithfulness then. That faithfulness continues down through all generations to today, and he will be faithful now. Let's pray. Father God, we are humbled and honored and blessed to be in your presence today. God, uh, we know that you will be faithful. It is hard sometimes, God, but we know that you will be faithful. So help us to rest in your faithfulness. Help us to be faithful to one another and to you, to bring you honor and glory. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. And thank you for these emblems that represent Jesus' body and blood to remind us of that faithfulness that continues through all generations. In Jesus' name, amen. finishing up online as you're finishing up here together would you continue with us in a time of worship please stand
song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside.
sound great this morning. Have a seat. We're going to watch a video from one of our global mission partners, Ryan Hardy in Papua New Guinea. This is what some of the Above and Beyond offering went to. Take a look. Hey, Victory, it's Ryan Hardy with Ari Torin from the Soap Tribe of Papua New Guinea. Uh, we're in Medang, Papua New Guinea, and because of your generosity in the Above and Beyond campaign, we are in the process of purchasing all of the supplies to put clean water in Igwe Village of the Soap and also at Igwe Public School. Uh, because of this, untold numbers of soap speakers are going to have daily access to clean water supply and easy access to clean water that they can carry to their homes. Thank you, Victory. Good morning, Victory. I just want to say welcome. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you're here. God has been doing some amazing things in Papua New Guinea through Above and Beyond. There's been clean water provided to the village, while our global missions partner, Ryan Hardy, and his team continue to translate the Bible. Speaking of global missions, I'd like to remind you about our mission trip to the Dominican Republic this summer. If you're interested in going, you still have a couple of weeks left to apply. Look out for more information on that later today. Now, one thing that we love to do at Victory is celebrate our first time guests. If it's your first time, we want to say welcome and invite you to text NEW to 317-576-2288. We want to get you some more information about Victory and a free gift. You won't want to miss out on it. Make sure that you're, if you are in the building, go and stop by the Connection Center to collect your free gift. Now, if you've been to Victory before, it doesn't matter how many times, we also want to know that you are here. Please tell us by checking in on the Victory app, which is conveniently found on the App Store. Now, it's so easy to connect at Victory through our events. If, or a couple events that we have coming up are worship night, baby dedication, if gathering, and group link. And I was only naming a couple. For a full list of all of our events and to register, make sure to visit victorycc.live slash events. Thank you so much for all the generosity you guys have been giving us. <laughs> Wow, Dad, you're right. This is way harder than it looks. <laughs> oh. Here at Victory, we do everything with generosity. If you have given at any capacity, we'd like to say thank you. So, you can get, here are a couple ways to give. You can give through the Victory app, online, uh, or at victorycc.life. Thank you so much for joining us, and let's kick off our new series, Kingdom. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God, a kingdom like no other kingdom the world has ever seen before. A kingdom that at its core would change the way we love, the way we give, the way we serve, the way we think, the way we live. And to many, the kingdom of God is a distant thing, something we gain access with the ticket of our salvation. But Jesus teaches us so much more. The kingdom of God is here and is now, on earth as it is in heaven. Don't sit back and wait. You have work to do. Seek the kingdom, build the kingdom, inherit the kingdom. Together, we're going to discover our role in bringing heaven to earth. Hey, how you guys doing this morning? 
Good. So glad you guys have chosen to gather with us today. There's so many of you in person and all of you out there on the line. Thank you for joining us. I just want to welcome in all of our first time guests. In fact, uh, we have an online first time guest watching uh, fr uh, from Mainville, Ohio, Linda Batson. So hello, Win Linda. Uh, and maybe this is your first Sunday. And if that's the case, you came on the perfect Sunday because we're kicking off this brand new series called The Kingdom. The, the Kingdom of God discovering our role in bringing heaven to earth. And this is going to be an eight-week series. So that's, that's a lot, right? So don't think eight weeks, think eight hours, all right? So and, and did you know that like in America today, that people attend church one in every six Sundays. And so just so you know, you can't grow like that. It's like hearing every sixth word. So please make a plan to stay with us and invest eight hours to grow in your relationship with God. And if you can't make it in person, join online or watch later on on demand. And who knows, eight hours could actually change the whole trajectory of your life. Now, before we begin this whole series, I have a couple of disclaimers. Uh, at points this, at the series, it's going to feel more like a classroom than a sermon, right? There's going to be more teaching. It's more informational than maybe inspirational, but it is foundational. I have a ton of scripture, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's all in the app. It's in your notes. Uh, there'll be things that I'll be sharing, diagrams, uh, timelines. It's all going to be in the app. And whenever you see this thing right here on any of the slides, that means you could find it later on in your notes or in the app under the resources. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, I think that this series actually addresses some of your issues with Christianity. And because I believe that people are walking away from Christianity not because of what we believe. I don't think people are walking away from Christianity because of what we believe. They're walking away because the people who proclaim to be Jesus followers don't believe it. The people who claim to be Jesus followers don't actually live it out. So if you're on the edges of faith, uh, this series might be for you, or, but, it, but it's not as applicable as the last one we just did on relationships, but it is critical for Christianity, and it will give all of us a, a new lens to look through when it comes to what we think about when we think about God. Now, if, if you want to give Christianity a shot, Maybe you're in the middle of a difficult season uh, of life. I would suggest maybe you go back out and on, online and check out some of the stuff on demand. This is the starting point of faith. Or maybe you need some hope in your life right now or what to do when there's nothing to do in the meantime. But you can check that all out maybe later this week. But the reason we're doing this series is because Jesus follow or not, it is possible to waste our lives. Do, do you believe that? It's possible to waste your life. And for, it's possible for you and I to be so focused on what's now or what's new or what's next or uh, that, that we end up wasting opportunities in this life right in front of us, like right now. It, it's possible to be so paralyzed by our past that we can't achieve our future. So focus on what has happened, what they did, or, or the busyness of life that you and, and I end up wasting our life right now. In fact, it's possible to love God and live life and miss out on the opportunity that God has placed right in front of us. In fact, I spoke with one of you a couple months ago, and you told me, as you look back on your life, you think you wasted from the time that you were 20 to the time that you were 40. And you were married, and you had kids, and you had a job, but you look back and you realize, I missed it. I, I squandered it. I, I missed the opportunity. I missed out on what was most important. I should have fought for my marriage. I should have been there for my kids. I should have let God use me more. But Josh, I, I wasted that part of my life. And I just want, that's easy to do, right? Because in the moment, it's hard to have perspective. In the moment, it's hard to see like the bigger picture. We all think that we're gonna have more time to figure this whole thing out. But it is possible for us to waste our life. And I don't want that for you. I don't, I, I want you to be able to experience life to the full. I want you to be able to experience life full of purpose and meaning. I want you to be able to experience life with less anxiety and more peace. I want you to be able to wake up every day with unshakable confidence in your future. And if you hang around for the next eight weeks, I believe we can lay the foundation for that. Of all of the perspective that you might need to live life full of purpose on purpose. That you can have a framework that can be the building blocks of your life as you and I discover our role in bringing heaven to earth. Now, even if you never decide to follow Jesus, 
We're going to be dealing with topics and, and things that we're going to get, provide answers to things that, that we deal with every single day. In fact, secular psychologists, they'll tell you that there are three things, three core questions to, human, to humanity. Who am I? Where do I fit in? And what difference can I make? So secular psychologists say, hey, no matter what you believe, we all, all of us have this in common. We all have to wrestle with this. Who am I? Where do I fit into this world? And what difference can I actually make? And, and as you and I dig into the kingdom, we will discover that Jesus, he gives us the answers to all of these questions. Jesus, he gives us a better identity. Jesus tells us that we belong to the people of God, that we're invited into God's story of living out the kingdom. That as we dig into our role of bringing heaven to earth, we will discover that Jesus, he gives us a better way to do life. And as we look back, at these real historical events, you and I can gain confidence because our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and when you and I see how God's plan unfolds and how God keeps all of his promises and how God doesn't just see crowds of people, but he sees and he invites and he cares and he loves for individual people in the crowd, that means you and I can gain confidence that God can do that for them. That means that God can do that for us as well. Now, when it comes to this whole idea of kingdom, there are a lot of misunderstandings. Like, here's some of the questions we're going to be talking about today. Like, what is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? And when is the kingdom of God? And if we were to take a poll, most people say when, when they hear kingdom of God, you know what they think about when they think about the kingdom of God? Most people, they think about heaven. That's what they think about. They, they think about something that they will experience in the future. They think about clouds and angels and harps and maybe seeing their grandparents, right? And there's a reason for this. In fact, in the New Testament, it speaks of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And we look around on earth and go, oh, it doesn't look like heaven here, <laughs> right? There's too much pain. There's too much suffering. There's too many sick kids here we have a magic kingdom, but that's in Disney. That's not, that's not it. Right? You can't find the kingdom of heaven on a map here, so it must be a future kingdom. It, it, it's kind of confusing. Whatever the kingdom is, though, it is important to Jesus because the kingdom of God occurs 68 times in the New Testament, and, and the kingdom of heaven occurs 32 times in the book of Matthew alone. And almost all of these kingdom talk, it almost always comes from the very lips of Jesus himself. He, he talks about the kingdom all of the time. He describes the kingdom all over the place. He illustrates the kingdom all over the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it doesn't really always seem clear as to what he meant. Now, when we use our Bible study tools that we've been learning about in our groups, uh, we need to look, and we can look at how these terms are used in Scripture. There's actually a passage that gives us some clarity in Matthew 19. Uh, Jesus is speaking to the rich young ruler, and, and he, he uses both phrases, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, and get this, he uses them interchangeably. So that means that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, as from Jesus' perspective, they are the same thing. And so whatever Jesus says, I, I just agree with, right? So these, these two phrases don't mean different things. They are the same, which actually adds more confusion. Now, just pause on that idea for just a second. And I want to bring light to when it comes to our approach to God. So often you and I have a skewed view of things, especially if you grew up in the church. We have a skewed view of things because when we think about God, we often think about religion, when we think about God, we think about our morality or maybe lack thereof. When we think about God, we think about maybe church. But Jesus came to show us who God is and what God's like. Jesus would tell us that, hey, we're not seeing clearly. Because when Jesus talks about God, he uses this idea of the kingdom. In fact, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the, Jesus used the word kingdom approximately 100 times, but he only uses the word church twice. The kingdom of God is a big deal to Jesus. So when we think about God, we think about maybe religion or our own personal morality or the church. But when Jesus talks about it, he thinks about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is the centerpiece to Jesus' teaching. But today we rarely talk about it. And when we do, we're often confused by it. I mean, just again, pause and think about what do people think the central message of Jesus is? If you're talking to the common person who maybe have positive view of Christianity, what do they think the central message of Jesus is? They would say, 
love. To which you say, Josh, isn't that right? Like we did a whole series on that, like where Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Like, isn't that true? Jesus said that the greatest command was to love God and to love one another. And please hear me, love is core to the message and the mission of Jesus. Love is absolutely core, but when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is not the central message of Jesus. And here's how you know that love isn't the central message of Jesus. The the Jews and the Romans in Jesus' day, they were enemies. And if Jesus' message, the central message that he was bringing, as he was bringing heaven to earth, if his central message was love, if Jesus just said, hey, he threw up a peace sign and just let's hug everybody. I'm going to walk around in flip-flops. Like if that, if, if, if that, the Romans would have protected a peacemaker like that, not crucified him. Not, not only that, the Jewish religious leaders would not have been threatened by a guy in rose-colored glasses saying, just love everybody. You know, that the rabbi that said that, like, th- th- they wouldn't be threatened by that. But those of you who know the story of Jesus, do you know why the Jewish leaders were upset? Is by his authority. He spoke as one having authority. That was their problem with Jesus. Which actually means from the very beginning, the fight in the kingdom of God wasn't about beliefs. It's about control. That was their fight back then and actually it's our fight still today. The fight in the kingdom of heaven is about control. It's about following. It's about God's kingdom authority. And King Jesus didn't come to take sides. No, he came to take over. And they were unwilling to surrender to God's rule, rule, unwilling to submit to the kingdom of God. And somehow, over the last 2,000 years, we've become detached by the kingdom of God from the central message of Christianity. See, love is at the core, but the central message from the lips of Jesus is all about the kingdom. I mean, think about it this way. Why did the Roman leaders allow Jesus to be crucified? In fact, the eyewitness, Matthew, talks about the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and history confirms him. Jewish Jewish historian Josephus, he writes about Pilate. Not only that, but in uh, June 20th of 1961, the University of Milan uncovered this in an archaeological dig uh, as evidence of Pilate's existence. This stone is 31 inches by 29 inches, and we found near the Roman capital of Judea, and it has Pontius Pilate's name on it. So this was a real person living in a real place who really meant Jesus. And so when Jesus was dragged up in front of Pontius Pilate, I want you to look at the charge made against Jesus. It says, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, Pontius Pilate, and the governor asked him, are you the what? King of the Jews. So the, the reason the Roman government was so hostile towards Christianity was not because Christianity was about a religion or sitting in rows or they sang some songs. No, they're that, that, not because they said love your enemies and hug everybody. No, the reason the Romans were so hostile to the Jesus followers is as they spread all over the Roman Empire, the first century uh, Christianity was not a religious term. It was a political term. It was a political term. In fact, in Rome in the first century, the reason Jesus' followers were persecuted, the reason Jesus' followers were executed was not because of their religious beliefs. It was because of their political beliefs. No, it wasn't Republican or Democrat. And no, it wasn't Rome versus America. Like that's not, those first followers of Jesus were persecuted because they pledged their allegiance to a crucified king. Not a country. They bent their knee. They leveraged their life. They sacrificed everything to follow a crucified king. That's what happened from the very beginning. It was a political term. That the kingdom of God is political. You have a new king. We have a new king. So the White House is not heaven. The president is not God. And this might shock you, but Jesus didn't stand, doesn't stand for our national anthem. He, he doesn't. And those first followers of Jesus, they were persecuted because they pledged their allegiance not to a country, but to a crucified king. Because Jesus claimed the right to rule our lives. He claimed the right to rule as king over us. And that concept seems to be lost on so many who sit in church and think of religion, who maybe sit on the couch and watch at home and gauge their own personal morality. But every Christmas when we read the birth narrative, We have this time, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. It's gonna be in your app, right? But in uh, 5 BC, we have the arrival of the king. Around one, or Luke 1, around 5 BC, when the king is born, we have the angels saying, do not be afraid to marry. God is very pleased with you. You will become pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you must call him Jesus, which is an English version of the Latin name, 
which came from the Greek name, which came from the Hebrew name, oh, Yeshua, that's his name, Yeshua, which actually means Joshua, that's a good name, or leader, or warrior. So in the manger is a leader, in the manger is a warrior, and the angel goes on to say he will be great, and he will be called the son of the most high God. So this is royal language. This is a royal title. He will be the son of the supreme king of the universe. Now there are thousands of times in history where a baby became a king, but there's only one where a king becomes a baby. And if there is any doubt about his royalty, continue to listen. It says, the Lord God will make him a king as his ancestor David was. That's Israel's second king. And he will be uh, the king of the descendants of Jacob for how long? Forever. And the angel goes on to make this promise. And his kingdom will never end. It goes on forever. Now, the Greek text, it comes across a little bit stronger. If you were to piece it together, it would be more like this. And of his kingdom, there shall not be an end. Your son will always be a king. Right? And we, he will always have a kingdom forever. And the fact that Jesus will always be king should give us confidence. It should give us hope. That is the foundation we need to follow him even when it's difficult. See, the kingdom of God is the centerpiece of the teaching of Jesus. Now, what is the kingdom of God? Well, simply put, it's God's rule and God's reign. To which you say, okay, Josh, but like where is the kingdom of God? Where, where's, where's it at? Well, in everyday English, uh, kingdom is a place where the king reigns. So when Jesus, he actually talked about the kingdom of God, he didn't say location. He talks about his authority. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom, th this wasn't about property or a building or a place. It was about control. And in the Gospels, Jesus uses this Greek word for kingdom. It's called basilia, basilia easy for me to say. Kingdom, sovereignty, royal power, authority, rule, especially of God, both in the world and in the hearts of men. And the word for kingdom in Jesus' native tongue, Aramaic, would be Malko which he probably used, and that, that would have meant royalty, rule, reign, kingdom, sovereignty, or authority. And so that means it primarily refers not to a geographical area or even the people or even the building, but the activity of the king himself, the authority of the king himself. That's how Jesus described it. In fact, in the, the par this parable, Jesus says, uh, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. So he didn't go to a new region to rule, but rather to get a new and greater authority over the place he already lived. That's how Jesus described it. And so in everyday English, what is the kingdom of, where is the kingdom of God? Well, it's simply this. Anywhere Jesus is recognized as king. That when we submit to our king, when you and I surrender to our king, we're living by the standards of heaven. The kingdom of God isn't an advanced, advanced by knowledge, Right? Did you know that the kingdom of God isn't advanced by you knowing more stuff? It is advanced by our obedience. And so where is the kingdom of God? Anywhere Jesus is recognized as king. Now, God's people, they should have seen it coming, right? There were predictions about the kingdom uh, in this timeline. They're basically all over the Old Testament. Uh, from the very moment that the fall happened and sin entered the world, the kingdom of darkness uh, invaded the earth. And immediately, in Genesis 3.15, there was a promise that God would make everything right. That he predicted a people, he gave that promise to Abraham, and they held onto that promise for a while. And as we can read the Old Testament, we see that there was a partial fulfillment in making Abraham's descendants uh, into a kingdom. And their concept of a kingdom was a very physical one. A physical king, a physical kingdom, a kingdom of dominance, a kingdom of power, right? And from, from 1040 BC to 540 or 86 BC, there was a partial fulfillment. And then the nation of Israel had kings, and they had some good kings, really good kings, and they had some terrible kings. They had the, the glory days of King David and King Solomon, and then they had some terrible kings where the kingdom became fractured. And so the promise of the coming kingdom was only partially fulfilled. And But we read in the middle of, of the text of those kings and those kingdoms, there was a promise of a future king, 
a great king, a, a promise of a perfect king and a perfect kingdom. In fact, in Daniel chapter two, verse four, the physical kingdom of Jerusalem was overtaken by Babylon. And into that moment, God gives his people hope. Into that moment, God gives his people a promise. It says during the reign of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all the kingdoms into nothingness and it will stand for how long? Forever. Do you, do you hear the dominance? Do you hear the hope? It may be bad now, but the king is coming. Stay faithful. It may be bad right now, but the king will make it right. Stay faithful. Not only that, but check out this, the, this uh, list of prophecies about the coming Messiah. Right? We put that in your app there for you. But Jesus fulfilled 300 uh, Old Testament prophecies of his earthly ministry, many of which, if he were not God, he would have no control over. Like where he was born, <laughs> what, who he is related to, that he was betrayed by a friend. In fact, the prophet Isaiah even predicts and describes how Jesus would die 750 years before crucifixion was even invented. The Jews uh, Jesus preached to knew that there was a promise of a coming king and a coming Messiah. It had been predicted. They anticipated a literal king with a physical kingdom, right? That was the timeline, but they, they, they only experienced a partial fulfillment. And now the time for us, it takes us to get from the Old Testament to the New Testament is the flip of a page. But for them, the people who lived it, it was 500 years, roughly 500 years of anticipating 500 years of hoping, 500 years of dreaming of that promised king and his coming kingdom. And into this darkness enters this great light, the arrival of a king. The Romans had dominated over the region of Galilee, but around 26 AD, the, the Jesus announces the kingdom. And he does it in a place that you could go and visit today. This is overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Isn't that beautiful, right? And so this is probably close to where Jesus stood. And Jesus says this in, in, in Mark. Jesus went to Galilee where he preached the good news. Uh, the, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. It is good news. I've got good news. And on this day, the people who heard Jesus were hoping that that kingdom that Jesus was bringing would overthrow the Roman government. That's what they were hoping, that Jesus would be the king who sits on the throne and he would be greater than King David. He would be richer than King Solomon. He would make everything right. He would bring us prosperity and wealth and he would deliver us our health. And he, this would be the beginning of Jewish world dominance. That's what they were hoping for. But Jesus was announcing a different kind of kingdom. And this is where their story really meets our story because into the difficulty and into the pain and into their routine and into the dark kingdom of darkness comes the kingdom of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. The rule of the king, the reign of the king, the sovereignty of the king, the authority of the king is near. And it didn't look like what they were expecting. And they missed it. They missed it. And Jesus says to them what I think he might say to us today Repent, 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 which simply means rethink your approach to life and God and everything else. Repent means to turn your life around. Repent means to change your mind and see your life differently, to live differently because re repent because and believe that I've got good news. I've got a better way for you to do life. I've given this new information that Jesus told them. I want you to rethink your approach to life and God and everything else because I've got a new way for you to live. I am your king. I have a new kingdom. The kingdom of God has come near. And Jesus was doing what he was doing had been predicted, but Jesus broke the mold of anything they thought this king would bring. So what is the kingdom of God? Well, it's God's rule. And God is reign. Where is the kingdom of God? Anywhere Jesus is recognized as king. And so when, when, when is the kingdom of God? Now, we read that, that the kingdom is announced, <laughs> but it hasn't arrived. It didn't arrive. In fact, in 27 AD, Luke chapter four, Jesus reveals the purpose of the king was to preach the good news of the kingdom, to let people know, hey, there's a better way to do life. And in 27 AD, Jesus demonstrates uh, kingdom thinking. In fact, in Matthew 5 through 7, it's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gives his followers an upside down and backwards way to view the kingdom. And he says some crazy things like, blessed are those who mourn. Like the meek will inherit the earth. Like love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. 
Jesus demonstrates the kingdom living isn't intuitive. The kingdom living is actually upside down and backwards. And then he invites people to enter into his kingdom. All right, this is what happens next. He invites people to enter his kingdom and people, and he invited people uh, was, that were kind of surprising because he lived in a culture where might was right, where women and children were considered more like property. And Jesus invites women and children and pimps and prostitutes and sinners and saints, anyone and everyone to follow him. Anyone and everyone is invited to be a part of the kingdom of God. And then in Luke chapter 11, uh, he, does, he, he flexes in an interesting way. He talks about kingdom power. And he acknowledges there's a kingdom of darkness attacking us in this world. He says, you have an enemy. In fact, look at how Jesus describes the leader of our enemy as a strong man, fully armed. And he isn't talking about Jesus. He's talking about the leader of the kingdom of darkness. He's strong, he's powerful, and he has weapons. He says, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. Your enemy is strong. But then he says, but when someone stronger, who's he talking about? Himself. When someone stronger attacks him and overpowers him, so this isn't sit in church and be quiet. No, this is I'm bigger than you, I'm stronger than you, let's fight. That's our king. He takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides his plunder. And then Jesus says, I come to take back anything the enemy has taken from you. I come to take back anything the enemy robbed you of. I come to take back anything the enemy has accused you of. And then he uses kingdom language. He says, whoever, that could be you, could be me. Whoever, whoever's not with me is what? Against me. I don't know what kind of flower smell and peace, love and wimpy Jesus you have in your mind, but you didn't get that from reading the Bible. You didn't. Now, in 29 AD, Jesus predicts the kingdom is coming. So it has not arrived it is not here yet. In fact, he's talking to his disciples and he says, some of them, not Judas, some of them, get this, I, I tell you the truth that some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Right? So I came to announce the kingdom and I, I came to establish the kingdom and I came to give you a new way to live, but it isn't established yet. That's what he's telling his followers. And, and again, this is confusing. Je Jesus was so vague. Do you, do you ever wonder why Jesus was so vague? Why, why did he just tell us? Like several times in the Gospels, they were ready to make Jesus a political king. They were ready to go fight the Romans and just make Jesus by king by force. I mean, check out how the eyewitness John says. He says, Jesus, knowing that they had intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. But see, Jesus wasn't establishing a kingdom like they had envisioned. He, had to be, uh, he was going to be a crucified king. Jesus had to die on a certain day, on a certain way, to fulfill all of the prophecies. That's why Jesus was so vague. But the religious leaders, they, they, they were looking for the kingdom. In fact, in 30 AD, Jesus hints that the king had arrived in their, their midst. It says, once again, uh, once uh, being asked by the Pharisees, the religious leaders, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that could be observed. So, so this is an unseen kingdom. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your, what? In your midst. Oh, the king's standing right here. <laughs> right? The king is all wrapped up right here. I, I'm, I'm leading this kingdom. I'm what you've been looking for. But the kingdom of God, it came at a cost. So you can't establish a kingdom without a fight. And the cost of the kingdom was the death of its king. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, that's when he actually purchases the kingdom, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's when the kingdom is established and see, Jesus didn't die on the cross to make us more comfortable. Jesus goes to the cross to bring us the kingdom of God. God with us, not against us. God for us. Now, now, even though you and I have been invited into the kingdom, and even though the price has been paid to make us right with God, and even though the kingdom has come, like the religious leaders of Jesus' day, we don't want to surrender control. In fact, in America, the personal freedom, personal choice, and personal preference, that's our king. I mean, isn't that really true? Just check out what fills our calendars, what empties our bank account, what fills our mind, personal freedom. It's my way or the highway. It's my body, my freedom, personal choice. I mean, we have Netflix and Spotify. They, they suggest content 
based off of our preferences. We live in a world where technology is caters to our every preference. And those aren't always bad things. They're not. But they make a terrible king. Now, we don't want to surrender because we're unsure where this king will lead us. We don't want to surrender because we're unsure what this king will demand of us. But let me ask you this. If your king will die for you, is he for you? If your king will die for you, is he for you? If your king will lay down his life in your place, does he, do you think he might have your best interest in mind? By his resurrection, Jesus purchases the kingdom. And then in Matthew 28, around 30 AD, Jesus deploys the kingdom. And I don't want you to miss this. In his final speech, before he ascends into heaven, catch this, he doesn't leverage, go love everybody. After his death, 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 burial, and resurrection, he doesn't just say, give everybody a hug and tell them, I love them, right? I, I want you to listen closely to what Jesus has leveraged right before the Great Commission, right before he ascends into heaven, right before he, he goes, tells us to go into all the world and expand my kingdom. Listen closely to what Jesus highlights. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, what? All what? Authority. So how much? All. Do you know what that means in the Greek? All, 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 every part, all authority will wear on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So any place you go on earth and any place you go, wherever you think you go after you die, like I have the power and I have the authority there. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And because of that, that's what therefore means, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. This is kingdom talk. This is kingdom authority. Jesus is claiming to be king. And so just before Jesus ascends to heaven, he gives his followers these commands. And this is why your church leadership at Victory is mission driven, not member driven. Because most people want a consultant, not a king. But, but as Jesus follows, we've been given a mission by our king. And we can't lose sight of what the mission is no matter what our members say. No, no matter what our members may prefer, our king's command are got to be more important to us. Now, don't mishear me. You are very important, but your preference isn't the most important. In fact, I spoke to a church leader from another church. They were more scared of their members than Jesus. I, I asked them about, how are you fulfilling the Great Commission to go and tell everybody? What, what disciple them? What does that look like? And they said, well, we would change some things, but our members wouldn't like it. To which I wanted to say, I didn't say, I wanted to say, you're 80. You're going to meet Jesus sooner than you might meet some of your members. Like, you should be more concerned about Jesus says than them. And I didn't say that. And I know I'm kind of a jerk. I, I, I understand that for even thinking that. But guys, it's time to wake up. Do you, you know that if, I, if we do everything I like as a church, we're doing it wrong. If, if we sing every song I like, we're doing it wrong. If every decision our leadership team makes, I, I agree with, we're doing it wrong because I'm not the king. Jesus is. And when I meet good King Jesus, all I want to hear is well done, good and faithful servant. He's the king. And I'm, I'm not. And if you're a Jesus follower, we, you have to be mission driven, not preference driven. Now, in Acts chapter 2, Luke points to this timeline and he gives us a proof that the kingdom has come. The kingdom has now arrived. And he gives us a prophecy from Joel. And Joel writes in around 835 BC, so 800 years, they're waiting for the moment that is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Now, now this is actually really a big deal. And this is a big deal because it affects our view of end times. Because in Acts chapter 2, he says you have proof that the kingdom has actually arrived. The kingdom has touched down on earth. That means you and I are living in the last days. And scripture teaches us that it's not some future event that the kingdom has actually arrived. So what is the kingdom of God? God's rule and God's reign. Where is the kingdom of God? Anywhere Jesus is recognized as king. Now when is the kingdom of God? Well, we say right now. To which you say if the kingdom is now, that's messed up. If the kingdom is now, that's not right. If the kingdom is now, I was looking forward to some more. Because as you look around, things aren't as they should be. I mean, I think of you when I think of this. I've met with so many of you who are sick. You have loved ones who have cancer. Some of you lost loved ones this very week. I was in the hospital with an eight-year-old fighting for his life this week who passed away yesterday afternoon. This world is broken. This world's not right. But when we read scripture, we found that the kingdom of God is now and not yet. Now 
And uh, yeah, and here's how we've experienced it. First, there's the engagement, and then there's the wedding. Now, and not yet. Maybe first you're pregnant, and then you become a parent. Now, and not yet. First, you finish high school, right? Hopefully, you graduate now, and not yet. Now, and not yet. The king makes promises. God will make everything right in the end. If it's not right, it's not the end. That's the king's promise. God's not done because God has made us a promise of a future kingdom and a perfect kingdom and actually a kingdom that will be triumphant here in the future. In fact, in Revelation 21, Jesus is establishing the final kingdom in the future. And it says this, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from where? A throne saying, look, God is dwelling places now among his people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. You know what that means? God will make everything right in the end. If it's not right, it's not the end. See, the kingdom is now. You are recruited now. The time to act is now. The kingdom is right now. But everything is not right yet. It's not right yet. Now, here's where you can have confidence that Jesus will fulfill all of those promises. It's because all of those prophecies in the Old Testament the, 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 the return of Jesus is the only one that hasn't happened yet. The other prophecies, all of them, they're, they're fulfilled. Every prediction was proven right. So as you and I face the enemy of darkness today, we can have unshakable confidence about our future. See, Scripture teaches that the kingdom of God wins. God, Jesus wins. The kingdom of God is now not in the sky, not in the future, but right now. But somehow we get confused. And we think it may be someday. Maybe we think it's about heaven. It's about later. It's about God's going to do something in the future. And we miss the opportunity right in front of us. We waste the opportunity right here in front of us. It is possible to love God and live life and miss the opportunity that God's placed right in front of you. But if you have a pulse, you have potential to advance the kingdom of God. Because when we submit to our king, when you and I surrender to our king, we are living by the standards of heaven. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is telling his followers how to pray. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy, be your name, your kingdom, what? Come. Your will be what? Done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. And that means the followers of Jesus are called to live now the way that one day everyone will live. Your will be done on earth right now, just as it is in heaven. That means if we follow Jesus, you and I need to wake up every day choosing to live today how one day everybody will be living. And the truest test of that is when you don't see and you don't understand, but you and I still follow. When we can't see it, but we still trust he's the king. When we submit to good King Jesus, you and I are surrendering to the greatest person to ever live. He had no servants, but they called him master. He had no degree, but they called him a teacher. He had no medicines, but they called him a healer. He had no armies, but kings feared him. He had won no military battle, but he conquered the entire world. He committed no crime, but he was crucified. He was buried in a tomb, but he lives today. That's our king. And he invites you, and he invites me to follow him, to follow him. See, followers of Jesus are called to live now how one day everyone will live. What, what if every Jesus follower just did that? What, what if we just lived as if Jesus would, was king? What would happen? Well, we would worry less and we'd have confidence in our future. We would care more about our community and we would embrace our role of bringing heaven to earth. Would you pray with me? Father, just thank you that we have a good king, a king that went before us, a king that, that promises us and comes through on all of those promises. Father, a king that, that paid the price to be right, for us to be right with the creator. And so Father, I pray that we live differently because we're surrendering areas of our heart and our life to our king. 
that we would live boldly because we have the confidence, the unshakable confidence that you are with us as our king. And we'd be forever changed because we know that you love us. You know, we know that you have our best interest in mind and we could live boldly and we could live bravely because of that. We thank you for good King Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen. Every single one of us have a next step. And if you're here in person, we'd love to begin a conversation with you. Maybe pray for some stuff that's going on in your life. Out the door and to the left. If you want to sign up for a mission trip, don't want to let that mission opportunity pass you by. Out the door to the left. If you're watching online, uh, text NEXT to 317-576-2288. And just remember to, to come back next week as we talk more about the kingdom and what it means to be living as kingdom people. Have a great week.